Hey everyone, this is Ross Ratty and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, vegetables, things that are a bit rare, how to grow all that stuff, how to use it in the kitchen, I mean, etc., etc. Everything that has to do with fruits or vegetables, all the really interesting stuff that if you guys love these kind of things, this is the podcast for you. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be talking pretty in depth with commercial fig production. I had a couple of viewers that on the YouTube channel were really interested in hearing my thoughts on commercial fig production and uh, really just ideas. I think uh, there's everyone's in a different situation. It's hard to give um, good advice for each individual situation, but I will try to give you guys good advice so that if somebody is interested in starting their own commercial orchard, um, you guys can follow these general adv pieces of advice. And for me, I'm also going to be starting a commercial orchard. Um, that's certainly a big goal of mine, and I can get into so many details about what exactly that I'm going to do. But I feel like it may actually change maybe a bit down the road. You never know. Um, certainly, we're going to be growing figs here in this climate under a greenhouse because probably the most important things regarding fig trees is well one you know there's the basics right you need uh you need your tree to survive okay that's pretty simple um you need to have full sun you need to have a certain number of heat units a certain length of the season uh but i think once you've got all that and which most of the country i think has assuming you can set up a greenhouse in your location um you then at that point are really concerned with the rain. Um, so if you are growing them in a greenhouse, yeah, you probably won't get the, the rain, but you can control the water and know exactly how much water you want to give these trees. Um, so if you are growing them outside or if you are growing them in a greenhouse, I would say anywhere that is very dry. Um, I mean, really the, the location of your orchard is going to be very, very important. I think a lot of people... Uh, are pretty dead set on doing a fig orchard and didn't really don't really have the best location picked out and to be honest uh, just a simple hoop house would really make a big difference keeping out a lot of the rain in different climates of the country you know uh, anywhere where there's about 20 inches of rain annually and most of that rain is then in the winter time that is really what you're looking for because that that humidity, that moisture really ruins the quality of these fruits to the point where you can't sell them. Uh, they go bad very quickly. The bricks is lower. Um, because the bricks is lower, the sugar content's lower. And if the sugar content's lower, uh, they're going to spoil a lot quicker. So you really want to focus on, I would say, site selection, choosing a place that is honestly... In, in the United States, really your only options is somewhere in California, maybe Arizona if you can get some water cheaply, um, or maybe like the southern half of Utah, somewhere in there. You know, there's very few climates in the United States that I would be like, yeah, that, that's Mediterranean, right? You got to have a real Mediterranean climate. I would say Florida is certainly warm, but. Florida's approaching tropical, right? It's got a lot of rain, a lot of uh, humidity on that that uh, that coast of the United States. So, for me, I'm not moving. I'm not going anywhere. But what I'm going to do is I'm really going to be building myself an efficient and effective way of protecting these things with a greenhouse. You know, um, insulating them, having an efficient heat source. You name it. Um, if I were to grow figs commercially here without some kind of hoop house, I just think it'd be a bit of a mistake. And we're going to actually do that this year. We're going to grow a whole lot of figs now. We're planting them in the ground. Um, you could certainly do a container orchard, but the production's quite low. You need to have a lot of trees. It's a lot of work. Um, I just don't think it's worth it in that sense. I mean, yeah, it's great and it's something, you know, because. If you're growing them in containers, most likely you can't grow them in the ground, and most likely the people in the area are not going to be willing to do what you're what you're willing to do. So you're going to find this niche market, and in terms of business, that's that's massive. You can pretty much set your own price. 
Um, you know, no one's gonna have them probably as early as you have, or maybe even at the quality you have. So, yeah, I'm not gonna say don't do that, but I'm just saying that for me personally, it's it's just not as much worth it. And um, you know, I I think um, we definitely have to have them in the ground here. So by having them in the ground, we're essentially getting more figs, a higher production, um, probably a longer ripening window, but we're exposing our figs to the elements, I think, a little bit more. And the elements really are key, like I said, the rain. So um, we have to protect them, but I think this year, like I said, I'm going to be planting around 40 varieties of figs this year with the intention of hopefully finding one that survives without any sort of protection that could be grown without a hoop house, without a greenhouse, um, and maybe could potentially put out some kind of fig that is reliable, um, that would be pretty decent for commercial potential. So, you know, and it's also, who, are, who is it that you're selling these figs to, right? Because now there's variety we have to think about. Right, so you know, leaning into that, are we looking at figs that are we're selling fresh, and who are we selling them to? Uh, are we processing them? Are we drying them? Are we making them in the jam? Um, I have a friend in Louisiana who's got plenty of fig trees, and he sells a lot of them in the form of jam. So you know, just because he's got a ton of rain there doesn't mean you can't do what you want to do, right? So. I think certainly variety in terms of size is going to be extremely important. If you're selling them fresh at a market, um, people want bigger fruits. Personally, the way that I'm going to be doing this from my entire life is that I have not cared about size. I have not cared about the appearance nearly as much. If the fruit is tasty, I want to eat it. And I want to explain that to people. I want to... Um, essentially coax them into this belief that uh, this is something they should eat and let them try it let them eat some you know you don't have to sell them the fruit to let them try it let them try it cut it open for them give it to them and you know if they get that wow factor you got a customer you know what I mean so that's my ideal goal was that not only to have these you know greenhouse systems you know, have these fig trees in the ground here, have that niche market, but also put these put these fruits that I'm gonna be growing in front of people who just don't know what they are. Let them try it. Let them experience the fruit. I think they're gonna be blown away. Of course they're gonna be blown away. If I'm blown away, I mean, they're not gonna be as excited as I am, but they're gonna be blown away. I mean, anyone in the right mind, I think, would be blown away by some of the fruits that I eat. You're not gonna like, not everyone's gonna like figs, not everyone's gonna like pomegranates, not everyone's gonna like persimmons, but um, for sure, there's gonna be some people out there that have never experienced these fruits that are just completely blown away. Um, so that's really the goal is to have some kind of section of the store or the farmer's market or the table, wherever we're, we're set up, wherever we are set up at, is that we've got a section here to let people try these things because these are not going to be things that really have a market. Um, figs are great. I think there is a market. There's an increased demand for them. People love figs. I haven't met too many women, in fact, that don't like figs. It's pretty weird. I think most women are just secretly fig lovers and um you know but that's the figs from the store or from a farmer's market you know i would think a lot of men would be way into these really intensely flavored figs if they had tried them so i just think that you know pretty much a lot of people like figs i see it every day people reach out to me every day it's obvious that uh you know this this fruit in general is just growing so and you can even see it in the prices of what these varieties are going for I mean it's just outrageous so you know I, I don't know where I was going with that but the point is basically variety selection is is pretty important and also a little section there to let them try this kind of thing so that they can um, you know experience it uh, I, to go back to varieties, I want to mention that, yeah, size is important or color is important. I know in certain countries, 
people only like specific colored skins. If the skin is not green or the skin is not um, black or dark, they don't eat it. Um, I know in most of the Middle East, they don't eat dark skin figs. Um, I believe in Hungary, they don't eat green skin figs. Um, I think uh, it really depends on the client. It depends on what they grew up with and what they've been kind of taught is normal. You know, I'm not going to eat a green banana because it's green. You know what I mean? So it just kind of is what it is. And you, ha you have to figure out what your market likes. That's really important. You know, the target market stuff that they teach you in, in business school is so, so important. But it's and it's so annoying to hear over and over again. But it's true. Um, know what your market likes. Also, in terms of variety, we have to think about the skin, how easy it is to um, manipulate in terms of your hands and how easy it, it, it can fall apart. Um, you know, a thicker skin is certainly going to be a, a fig that is better commercially. We also have to think about picking them, right? Here's a fig right here called Encanto. It has a long neck and a long stem. This really makes it easy to pick. And it's really important that when we pick them, that we're taking the entire stem with it. We're not um, ripping it at the neck. That's going to decrease the shelf life. You know, there's all kinds of tips to really increase the shelf life of these things that I don't necessarily have a full understanding of just yet in terms of exact numbers. Like, you know, we definitely want to chill them, right? What temperature do we want to put them in? I don't know. You know, we certainly want to have them in a tray that has a tray where it's like an egg carton where each section of the, the egg carton is for one individual fig. You know, if you can stack them all up on each other, they're going to get smushed. You know, it, it, all this stuff kind of adds up. And I really could go on and on and on about this. Um, also, what's really important, it, not just besides the color, the size, how easy it is to pick it, uh, but also when you pick it. And this really also is going to be up to you and your market. Here's a fig right here. Um, if we go back, this is Italian 258. That is probably perfectly ripe for a, uh, a commercial fig. Um, I would say maybe even a day, a day before this or maybe two days before this is what commercial fig growers pick it at. Um, or maybe this is the exact day. It's pretty close to this. So if you got a fig that's 0% ripe, which means it's not edible, to 100% ripe is when you would pick it in your backyard to get the most flavor possible. These growers are picking them at 60%. And then, of course, they're shipping them. And the reason why they pick them so early is because the sap flow at that point hopefully is gone. It's not astringent. It doesn't give you that nasty mouthfeel. The sugars have increased just enough and it's not so soft that you can manipulate it very easily and the shelf life will be at its highest at that point. So that's really the basics but for me personally I don't really like them too much at this point. This particular fig I do, right? I really enjoyed this Italian, Italian 258. But not every variety is going to be like that. Uh, I would really like for people to experience not only in my store different fruits or at the farmer's market, different fruits that they've never had before, but also when they're supposed to be picked right off the tree, locally, you know, not shipped. It's right, th right then and there. It's as if they picked it off the tree themselves. You know, that's my objective. <clears throat> and if I can get that to them, you know, this is not going to be the most, um, you know, longest lasting shelf life product. That's why we have things like apples and pears, right? You know, why kind of make force that this particular fruit into that scenario? Why think about this? Why, why do we have to think about these things in the same way that people have been doing it for the last maybe 50 years since really uh, agriculture has gone nuts and we started using, you know, synthetic fertilizers and really having lots of, um, you know, monocrops. Why do we have to follow these really crappy standards that all these people have been putting up and forth? You know, this is not going to be the way. I, I know it in my heart. This is not going to be the way. Just because I'm, you know, just because I'm, I'm only one person, right? And I'm obsessed with this kind of thing. 
But I can very easily see other people that are my peers, similarly aged, they all get this. I explain this to them and they get it. They understand where I'm coming from. They understand that our food is just complete crap, right? There's a wave of new farmers. There's a, there's a wave of new thinking uh, out of younger people. And I just honestly believe that these figs and a lot of these fruits are not going to be conventionally grown forever and conventionally harvested, conventionally picked the same way. It's going to be different. Someone's going to be doing something different and it's really going to, um, it's going to change something. Maybe it won't change something as drastic as, you know, figs as an example, right? But for certain, I don't want to be giving these people these figs at, if it's at 60% ripeness, but 100% is perfect, I don't want to be giving them at 60%. I feel like I'm robbing them. And I feel like that's why I have gotten into this to begin with, is that I didn't want to be robbed of the flavor and the, the nutrients and the sugars and the quality from these people picking them too early and going to the store and getting that. I wanted to experience the full thing for myself and that's what I want for my customers. So it's all up to you. It really does. I mean, I, I know I just went on this whole spiel, but it's all about how you feel about this. If you're really thinking about starting an orchard of any kind, you really should have some kind of passion beyond the fruit itself. So that's my personal uh, personal opinions on that. So we talked about the varieties. We talked about when to pick these things, um, how to pick them, right? Um, we talked about the climate. For you know, we t we touched on the climate. I guess more points about the climate is that you know we do we do want full sun, right? Um, we did, we did talk about this. So I think water again, it really is your biggest enemy. Um, what are some other things that people have been asking me regarding commercial fig production? You know, how would I do it? Um, we talked about the market, right? Know your market, figure out a strategy. You, and, and here's, here's the beauty of the niche is that not many people are going to be growing figs. You, you have lots of restaurants that love to do things with figs. There's a million things to do with figs in terms of processing them, using them in the kitchen. You don't have to always eat them fresh. And there's probably tons of restaurants in the area, Mediterranean style, higher end restaurants that would really love to have these things in their kitchen and they'd be willing to pay for it. You don't always have to sell to you know, someone who is a, a an individual that's just going grocery sh uh, shopping. You know, these could be restaurants. Um, and that's really what my plan is. I'm gonna start off with restaurants and work my way from there, get myself a nice little contact list through the restaurants. And then eventually, if we have enough production, we can then start moving on to everyday people. So, and then the other big thing here, I think, is that because you are growing them, let's say, in a more advantageous way. If you're in California, you're just growing them in the ground. The chances of you having something real special is unlikely. Everybody's growing brown turkey. Everyone's got black mission. Everyone's got tiger panache. You know, um, you know that's another thing, by the way, in the, in the terms of appearance. They got the stripes. Maybe there's a potential stripe fig that could be the next commercial variety. I doubt it, but... You know, that could be another option. But the point is, if you're in California, you've got a lot of competition. There's people that can do this very easily. Where I live, it's very difficult. Um, you know, so I have an innate, huge niche that I can easily tap into and take advantage of. I can set the prices I want. Also, I'm going to be getting them early. You know, the goal here is also to compete with California because not only do I want to have fruits at a similar time frame that these commercial growers in California are getting them at, but I want to have them at a much higher quality. So that's really the key here is that if, if I can't at least beat them in terms of timing, I need to have a better something, whether it's a better variety, a better flavor, better quality, you know, you name it. You have to differentiate yourself from somebody that's right down the road, you know. Um, 
and that certainly getting yourself an earlier crop of whatever it is is going to net you a much larger price because you can set the price at that point. Um, what else do we want to mention here? You know, there's lots of characteristics with these varieties too, with the eye, spoilage, um, the skin, the skin thickness, how easy it is to manipulate. You know, we we talked about this. Um, I there's someone who did ask me about growing figs in a polyculture setting and more of a more of like a permaculture style setting, um, or just an orchard that is set up. You know, something along the lines of like J.M. Fortier or um, that dude in Canada growing apples. What was it? What is his name? But basically, someone who's got not just rows of figs, but also has things around it helping it. Um, and I would say that really depends on the climate, depends on your situation. So it's very difficult to answer. I would say in my climate, a nice little polyculture. Um, is going to be something that's going to deter pests or bring in beneficial insects to kill unwanted pests because the biggest thing that I struggle with is the fruit fly. Um, the birds don't really necessarily bother them. You can certainly net the trees. Um, you know, that's a bit of a pain. But, um, you know, there are ways around other different critters. Um, it's very difficult to stop insects and. I would say find a way that you can have birds and other things that they can munch on or eat different things in your yard or in the orchard that are around the, that ripen around the same time as figs and, and they'll go after those at the same time. They'll go as they'll go after those instead. I'm sorry, not at the same time. So, you know, things like maybe the squirrels might go after you know some persimmons instead of the figs uh you know even raspberries and blackberries you could certainly have birds go after those later in the season rather than the figs um you know there's a number of different fruits um but then again that's gonna a lot of that stuff may actually encourage then discourage you know there's also that theory of like having a, a bird bath will a bird bath work i don't know a lot of people claim that because there's water, the birds are not as thirsty. They don't go peck all the fruits. You know, uh, there's also people that say, well, the bird bath brought them in, and now they have a home here, and yada yada yada, etc. So it really is. Uh, it's difficult to say. I will say that if you can get things like hummingbirds, um, they really love to feed on SWD. That's certainly the biggest it seems like the biggest um you know in terms of the animal kingdom that's like the the king of the jungle in terms of a lot of these insects so if you're thinking about you have swd problems which you probably don't if you're in a dry climate if you're growing them in a greenhouse you probably don't have a a problem but you know get some flowering plants that may bring in some hummingbirds get some hummingbird feeders um get yourself again just lots of flowering plants that'll bring in a lot of these beneficial insects don't have any standing water pick up all the decaying leaves on the ground do not let any of these leaves fall if you have problems with rust i i really would um i would really recommend using something um, that has silica in it whether it's a foliar spray either it's dynagro protect or uh, some diatomaceous earth or something on the soil level that's going to be absorbed into the soil that these plants can uptake to help fight against rust if you're in a, a more humid climate. Um, I did have a really great thought just now. We were talking about amendments. Oh, so if you guys are in Florida, here's another big pro tip. Is if you guys are in Florida and you're thinking about having commercial orchard is that I would certainly only grow figs on a nematode, a root not nematode resistant rootstock. It seems like LSU purple is that rootstock. I know there's people that are trying it now, uh, as I've been suggesting it to a lot of people, but I haven't heard any solid results. But there are some root not nematode resistant varieties out there that 
a lot of people are, believe it or not, turning to, and because they're on these rootstocks, an actual commercial industry could flourish in Florida. And that's one of the biggest reasons why figs just do not do well in Florida. Um, they have the heat, right? It doesn't get too cold there. And then the the only thing they really deal with is the rain and the nematodes. So, you know, also grow these things in uh, in a well-draining soil too. I forgot to mention that. The soil is really important. Um, I think limestone soils really will benefit you in that you will have, um, you know, a soil that is not holding too much water but also isn't too dry, right? That limestone really creates the, the perfect amount of moisture. That's why these grape, these grape growers across the world are getting such good grape quality and wine quality from grapes that are pretty much dry farmed in areas that are heavily the soils are heavily um, you know infested with uh, with limestone you know uh, figs naturally grow really well in rocky areas sandy areas desert like climates Mediterranean climates um, a lot of times you find them growing in the in, in a crack in the sidewalk I mean they're just really are just weeds man they're fighters so um, I wouldn't recommend really feeding them too much and I wouldn't recommend watering them too much and I would really pay attention more so to micronutrients I wouldn't really pay atten too much attention to things like nitrogen or phosphorus I would do lots of potassium um, that may help with fruit quality I certainly would pay attention to your soil profile right I mean that's an obvious one you know check out the boron levels check out the calcium magnesium levels um, those are big ones with me I'd also recommend checking out um, you know uh, um, silica I think that's really really important it seems to do really great wonders for my figs amend the soil get yourself a nice soil profile and don't be planting these things you know in a ditch somewhere you know if you've got them though in a place that's super dry maybe less than 20 inches of rain annually you know you may want to think about mulching you may want to think about planting them lower in berms you know you may want to you know really adjust the method that you guys are using for me um in my climate in my areas we're very clay we have lots of water so i'm trying to plant things higher i'm trying to decrease the nutrients i'm trying really figs do better in um poorer soils i'm not i'm not kidding like uh even some other more mediterranean fruits or subtropical fruits like even pomegranates you know these things don't are not pomegranates I'm, maybe pomegranates too but certainly persimmons is that persimmons and figs really don't fruit that well in really fertile soils they they really like to um you know they really like to just keep growing and not fruit so i think that's a big tip is not care too much about the nitrogen lower the nitrogen maybe even lower the phosphorus depending on where you live depending on your soil um let's see we talked about nutrients I did have one more thought and I honestly I could go on and on I think on this video forever I, I really hope this one's helping a lot of people out um, you know if you're interested in this kind of thing and and really want some hands-on help you know I can certainly do some consulting work we've done some consulting work now in the past it's something I really like to do um, so check out the website send me a nice little email on the website if you are interested in consulting work setting up an orchard of any kind in your backyard I'd love to hear about it love to hear about your situation and how I can help um, yeah the websites rossratty.wixsite.com slash blog you just go on there on the consulting page and you can certainly um, send me a nice little message and I'll be certainly willing to give you some pricing see what we can do see what needs to be done um, and even do it on online whether it's on Skype or maybe even potentially uh, person to person so alrighty anyway thanks everyone everyone or thanks again everyone for watching this episode of fruit talk also check us out on uh, Facebook Instagram and Twitter we have lots of content there we've also posted on the website by the way two new blog posts one on um, 
the five goals we talked about last week uh, of the 2019 season. Also, we did a nice little blog post on the Salavatsky pomegranate that has survived our two degree Fahrenheit winter this year with zero damage. Um, it, I knew, always knew it was going to be hardy, but now I have the, the proof and now we should get a pretty good crop this year off my pomegranate. So really excited to have one of those in the ground that can reliably fruit for me. That's really cool. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for again, again for watching this one. Take care and uh, get out there and start a fig orchard.